So this research started actually more than 10 years ago. I came to Cal State Fullerton 15 years ago, and I started teaching the um, one of our general education classes on California cultures, which is one of the classes that's recommended for future social studies teachers. Yeah. And so I made an assignment because so many of my students were future social studies teachers. And so I decided they, for a final project, they could turn any of the information from the class into some sort of lesson plan for K through 12 students. And I, I thought this was going to be a great assignment. It would help, you know, serve students' future professionalization. But the students kept telling me that they wouldn't dare share the things I taught them. That the things I was teaching, which I didn't think were that radical, to them, some of the students told me if they were to teach them in a K through 12 classroom, they would first send home a permission slip. To them, history was as controversial as sex ed. And this surprised me um, because I, I feel like I teach pretty mainstream history, but I do teach about ethnic minorities. I teach about workers and immigrants. Um, Cal State Fullerton is wonderfully diverse and I want my students to see themselves reflected in the curriculum. I didn't think that was radical, but they thought that the approach that they were hearing in college was not appropriate for K through 12 education. And so as a historian, I got curious about where this came from. So I just started going around. I started with the historical archive of the LA Times and I looked up social studies and controversy to see when was social studies controversial. And that led me to, there was a running headline in the LA Times in the late 60s and early 70s and it was called Land of the Free Controversy. So here I have, I brought, this is Land of the Free. This was the textbook for eighth grade students in the late 60s. It was only very briefly used. And if any of you remember it, I will be incredibly impressed um, because most people don't remember their textbooks. But this textbook became a flashpoint. So I started digging into what it was. And it turns out my students were right. Social studies was as controversial as sex ed. Um, they were, in fact, related controversies. It, the, um, Stephanie George back then was working at Cal State Fullerton and she helped guide me to the Freedom Center, which has this amazing collection of pamphlets that some of which were discussing Land of the Free. I talked about this at a conference and someone else then mentioned that Cal State Dominguez Hills has an incredible archive of the California Curriculum Commission. And the great thing about writing about a history textbook is that the people involved knew this is history in the making and so they kept their archives. It wasn't too hard to find. Um, so, and the other great thing is so many of these conservatives who were a set by the textbook, they were amazing writers. So one of them called this textbook Propaganda and Poppycock, which I just love. So I am here today to tell you about Propaganda and Poppycock, because I think it's not just the story of a textbook. It's a story about how we understand our past, how we teach the next generation, and what our collective memory making is. So... I will start off. In the 60s, there was a whole bunch of conservatives who were really interested in history. So um, here I have a couple of pictures. This is Max Rafferty, who was um, the ultra conservative California school superintendent in the 60s. You, you guys might remember him. He, he ran um, unsuccessfully for Congress. He wanted to use nuclear weapons in Vietnam. He, uh, he, wanted, he was a, an extreme conservative. Um, and, uh, but there was also Ronald Reagan, of course we know, but many of us forget that in the 60s, what he was doing was performing on Death Valley Days, which was a TV show of celebrating white pioneers. There was John Schmitz, the U.S. Senator from Orange County, who is the highest ranking elected official who, was, who we know of, who was a member of the John Birch Society. He had written his master's thesis. Its title was Controversy Over Collectivist Influence in Social Science Textbooks. That was his master's thesis in 1958, but he, through the 60s, he all the time went and, and testified against any book that praised the UN, he felt that the UN was dangerously collectivist, or discussed evolution, or was soft on communism. He, he had a huge concern about textbooks. 
And there was also in the late 60s, the rise of conservative private Christian schools which is usually associated with um, the desegregation that was happening in public schools. But I think, and I never could fully trace this, um, but it did also coincide with controversies over school textbooks. The, this other image I'm showing here is a map of the bookstores of, that, of the um, conservative women activists across Southern California. This is from a, um, goodness, I have to turn around and find it. It's from Michelle Nickerson's fabulous book, um, Mothers of the New Right. Um, and they had bookstores to, to sell conservative things. And it's striking how many of these bookstores were even named after historical figures. It's Poor Richard's Bookstore, Patrick Henry Bookstore, Betsy Ross Bookstore. They were very concerned with how we tell our past. And so Many of these images are men, but many of the people involved on, on the regular level were women. Um, Michelle Nickerson calls this housewife populism that joined with anti-communism and Christian traditionalism and carved out this female niche in politics um, where history didn't seem so partisan. It seemed like a woman's area. Um, and it fit too with a lot of women's schedules. You could have ideas about history and teaching that fit and led people to more politics. With all the conservative interests though, statewide liberals were generally in control other than Max Rafferty and John Schmitz, the Senator. Um, California issued a new social studies framework in 1962. It was coming up on the centennial of the Civil War. It, there was early civil rights movement. There was um, the con, the, the whole conflict with Sputnik had led to new emphasis on education. Um, and so they had this new look at their textbooks. And the chapter of CORE, the, um, the Radical Congress for Racial Equality at Berkeley, did a special study of textbooks. And these textbooks that were in use in California through the 50s and 60s were um, were lacking. The, uh, the core study, I'll give you some quotes from it. They called these textbooks so bland as to verge on amorality. These textbooks described slaves as happy um, and unaware of freedom when it came. They didn't name the Civil War the Civil War. They called it the war between the states. Um, and the people at Berkeley who were examining these textbooks said <laughs> The textbook authors are just being overly sensitive to the sensibilities of the Southern market. That was their phrase. But of course, the Southern market isn't just the Confederate States. In the 60s, there was also a huge movement of people from the South to Southern California. This is the stuff that Darren Dochuk wrote about in his great book, From Bible Belt to Sunbelt, that in some ways that Southern market could also <laughs> include Southern California. <laughs> Um, and uh, so they called for a new textbook. Their new textbook called for what they called a correct portrayal of Blacks and other minorities. And UCLA, UCLA professor John Coey and his wife Larry Coey got together with their son-in-law, Ernest May, and here I give you their pictures. I could not find a picture of Larry, um, who is amazing here, partly because a lot of historians in the 50s and 60s co-wrote textbooks with their wives, but very few actually gave their wives author credit. They're usually the wives are mentioned in acknowledgments. The fact that Larry got author credit is, is pretty amazing, but there's not many pictures of her surviving. But there's John Coey. John and Larry Coey were big members of the ACLU. They were working to desegregate the Los Angeles public schools, but they also wanted to desegregate the textbooks. They saw a connection between between what's in the books and who's sitting in the classrooms. Ernest May, their son-in-law, is a Harvard professor who, uh, with a specialty in international relations. And then they also worked with the very famous John Hope Franklin, who's famous for his work on African-American history, which I just read in the 2019 most banned books in libraries still includes John Hope Franklin's book, um, From Slavery to Freedom, that got reissued in 2010. They, they worked over the summer. They all stayed at the Lowry's house, I'm sorry, the Coey's house. Um, they actually remortgaged their house to pay for the images in this new textbook they were writing and to pay for the what they wanted on the cover. They wanted uh, Benton's Ride of Paul Revere. To pay for that, they had to sell their beloved grand piano. 
They wanted to have a textbook with a lot of images, and they wanted to have this diverse textbook. It was the only one written to meet the new state requirements, and so it was the one accepted. It underwent statewide review, um, and then in 1967, every eighth grader received the textbook. As I was piecing this together, I, I did what so many of us do. I made this timeline because it kept on not working with the evidence I was finding in the archives. The complaints weren't coming in the year 1966 when the review was open. The complaints were coming in 68 and 69 after the textbook had already been adopted. Um, and that was one of the questions I had. I'll tell you a little more about what I think was going on. Um, but first I wanna tell you about the textbook itself. Let's see, how do I get to my next slide? These are its opening lines. This was, can you all read it? Or do you want me to read to you? I see the nods. Okay, so I'm gonna guess you guys can read it. I know sometimes it shows up small on the screen. This textbook did not pretend to be objective. It wasn't though that so bland as to be a moral sort of thing. It had a point of view, it had a thesis, and it had a writing voice too. It had a narrative, which was that America hasn't always lived up to its stated ideals, but has gotten closer to it over time. Um, I'll give you a little more. It also had, it had so many pictures, which were often very progressive images. Um, this is uh, Ben Sean's poster for the CIO union. Um, this is Dorothea Lange's image of pea pickers. This is Simon Rodia's Watts Towers, which was, um, you know, it was in Life magazine, but it wasn't quite as famous then. This is Herb Locke's cartoon about McCarthyism. Um, these are some pretty radical images. It also had um, really impressively open-ended questions. As a teacher, one of the things I love about this textbook is the end of chapter questions because it was not about memorization. Instead, it had, it told students, keep a notebook full of quotes that inspire you. I don't know how the teachers actually graded this kind of thing. It said, um, let's see, imagine what Anne Hutchinson's children felt after they were banned from Massachusetts and had to walk to Rhode Island. Write a letter from her, the point of view of her children to her. Um, consider what you yourself can do to mitigate the bitterness that lingers after the Civil War. Check your local history archives and figure out how your own local town voted in the really controversial election of 1876. These are assignments I don't think we could give to eighth graders now. Um, they were open-ended, they trusted teachers to, to judge some really subjective stuff. This was a book who wanted students to think for themselves and not parrot things. Um, the, here are the, uh, some of the, in the end, it quoted Lyndon B. Johnson um, praising African-Americans freedom struggle. And it concluded with unfinished business as we keep moving towards equality and civil rights. So, those who think that textbooks should be neutral were especially offended by this because it wasn't neutral. Um, and those who think that history is a set of sacred facts to be memorized, for them, because history was sacred, this textbook verged on heresy. Um, so there was, there was a backlash. Here's some of the backlash. This is from a, um, a pamphlet um, in 1966 written by um, probably by Ford Samus, who was a dentist uh, who lived near Pasadena. And these were the subheadings in his pamphlet about propaganda and poppycock. Um, he felt that, uh, that this book would, uh, would make people feel guilty, that it overemphasized African Americans. He actually, he wrote that African Americans are only 10% of the US population and have probably committed less than 10% of history, which I really love that idea that we can commit history or not. Um, and uh, that, uh, that it mocked America, mocked religion, um, projects negativity, criticizes business, plays politics, creates flat class hatred, is slanted towards civil rights. Um, 
some of this led the authors, the, the early criticism led them to do a little revision and to talk about businessmen, philanthropists, um, to make sure that they were saying positive things about religion. Even Max, the, uh, sorry, I'm forgetting his name, my goodness. Um, even, even the, um, let's see, goodness, Max Rafferty. Even Max Rafferty said after the revisions, this was a great book, but the critique did not quiet down. It kept on going. Um, and the critique slid into a lot of falsehoods. It said that Negroes appear in every chapter of the book when they didn't. It said that the Pledge of Allegiance was missing and the Declaration of Independence was missing. It wasn't, they were there in the book. Um, they said that the book failed to describe specific battles of World War II or the Watts riots when no other existing California textbook described those either. Um, and some critics said that this book, which was published in 1967, had somehow motivated the free speech movement at Cal Berkeley in 1965, which makes no sense. Um, but it reflects that people were feeling a lack of control. They were feeling like this newer generation of kids in the 60s was slipping away from traditional values and, and they felt like this textbook might be one of the things responsible for that slippage. The curriculum committee letters were fascinating because these letters often repeated the same talking points, but they don't always say why? Um, one of them said, recently I attended a gathering of interested mothers and grandmothers to hear reviews of Land of the Free. Many of them didn't actually read the textbook. They had just heard these things. This might have been the John Birch Society, which often had these sort of gatherings and encouraged people to then write letters as individuals and to not say that they were Birchers. But it might have also been just wider conservative networking. There was pamphlets around. There was, there was a film made to criticize Land of the Free. I still don't know who funded this film or why. Um, there was, and this letter that also mentions it was mothers and grandmothers. Most of the letters, 81% of them were signed by women. Um, another portion of them were only signed with initials um, and so you, or were written anonymously, so you can't tell. Only 6% of the letters came from men. This was very much um, a woman's movement. And many of these people didn't write with conventional grammar. Um, here's, here's another one. Please delete from the book all controversial wrong historical records detrimental to our America. There's sort of excessive underlining going on here. This isn't a professional academic. And the letter writers were criticized for that because the people who defended this book, who thought they were progressives, also thought that only credentialed people can talk about history. Um, these these people kept on criticizing. And what's interesting to me is these, the conservatives in the late 60s, these are savvy political people, but they were criticizing at the wrong time and to the wrong people. In, um, in Orange County, the school board spent five months debating this book, even though the Orange County school board in the 60s had no jurisdiction at all over textbooks. And then they moved on to debate sex ed. This was a very linked thing. Pasadena also, this was sort of greater LA suburbs. Pasadena um, debated whether to reject all state funding for their school, by, because that's what happens to people who, who refuse to accept the eighth grade textbook. Downey, um, right on the border of Orange County, also not only risked um, all state funding, but they risked a misdemeanor charge. They, they had a lawsuit. Um, Students in um, the further inland empire actually committed civil disobedience, which we often think of as a tool of the left in the 60s, but these were people on the right. And their civil disobedience was they refused to be in the classroom where this textbook was. In Orange County, students didn't have to commit civil disobedience because in Orange County, the authorities already made alternate assignments and, and made plans to accommodate the students who did not want to use this textbook. The Santa Ana School District issued a supplemental guideline, especially on what they thought of as the most controversial chapters about workers or and the world we live in. So why would savvy political people spend so much time at the wrong meetings 
I think that it wasn't just about rejecting this textbook. I think it was about exhausting the opposition. By 1971, this textbook was pushed aside and two new textbooks were chosen so that each local area could choose which of the two textbooks to use. That 1971 textbook was not at all controversial. There, it drops out of the newspapers and there's actually, it's hard to trace the textbooks through the 70s. The controversy died away because the textbook publishers also shrank back from this kind of controversy. Textbooks are now written by committee. There's often, there's a historian's name on the front, but the textbooks often contradict that historian's other work. Um, they're written by committee, they're written very carefully. They're still fulfilling what the um, early 60s group at, uh, at Berkeley said, they're still so bland as to verge on amorality. Um, part of what shocked me about this whole thing is that usually even those who study public memory and public history don't pay attention to textbooks because we're teachers, we know how little students pay attention to textbooks. Um, the people in this controversy though, they paid attention, they really cared. So usually public historians study monuments or amusement parks or, or the roadside signs, but this was a case where the textbook itself became a lightning rod for people who were concerned about their loss of use, who were concerned about their sacred documents. Um, I'll, I'll read to you from uh, Max Rafferty, because I think I have time, right? Yeah, I do. This is uh, his, what he called the red, white, and blue mist. I love this man's writing. Let one generation grow up knowing nothing of John Smith and Pocahontas, John Alden and Priscilla Mullen, and the magic chain which links the future to the past is broken. These are the things, these and a thousand more, which have made and preserved us as a nation, which cluster together in a red, white, and blue mist out of our past, so that wide-eyed children will always remember Farragut in the shrouds at Mobile Bay, Teddy Roosevelt at San Juan Hill, Dolly Madison saving the portrait of Washington, Betsy Ross and the first flag. Did any nation ever have a finer heritage to pass on to its sons and daughters? Without the great hero stories, we are left in the schools with statistics on immigration and economic development, dry as dust treaties and proclamations, accounts of population trends and antitrust legislation to give to the children in the guise of history. They'll grow up inevitably with the same amount of love and reverence for their native land, which they would feel for a mathematical theorem or a chemical formula. This in the second half of the 20th century is just not good enough. Um, I love, I, I love his imagery. I love his passion. Um, and I actually, even though I don't share his politics, I do share his belief that history should be about people. I also think it's kind of a losing battle. I mean, I don't know how many of us now remember John Alden and Priscilla Mullen or even Farragut in the Shrouds at Mobile Bay. Um, some of what he mentions there are still touchstones, but some of them are not. Um, this kind of history that, that insists on memorizing certain canonical things, the historian Jill Lepore has called historic fundamentalism. And this textbook threatened that kind of fundamentalism because it wanted students to think for themselves. It also wanted to combine what college historians know with what gets taught in K through 12. It wanted questioning and it wanted to not be bland. So in doing that, it offended a lot of people, but it still inspires me. So that is the history as I've uncovered it. And I think that is a great segue to me now wanting to hear your own questions. I'm going to stop the share um, and check the chat. I am terrible. I can't read the chat. The chat. Um, okay. Um, oh, this book, Land of the Free. Yes, it's um, it's out of print, but it's frequently available in used bookstores um, on places like eBay. It looks like. Um, look, John S. already found it. Um, yeah, and it's not pricey. It's a uh, and it. It is really fascinating. If you have access to a, um, a library with good interlibrary loan too, you can get the teacher's guide, which I love, which has more activities and questions. Um, so there you go. Um, so 
I think I've caught up with the chat questions. Now is the time when I want to hear more of your questions. Yes, John S. Yeah, thanks for the presentation. Um, I grew up in Corona Del Mar and I graduated in 67 Corona Del Mar High School, but I do remember there was probably five families from the John Birch Society right in my little neighborhood in Corona Highlands. What did the, uh, when did the Birch Society of Welch essentially die out though in Orange County? Oh, that's a good question. Um, because they didn't, they weren't always public, um, it's hard to trace. But in the 60s, people put Birch Society politics into their annual Christmas letters, which is one of these, you know, like, hi, everybody, here's what happened this year. Don't forget to vote for Max Rafferty for superintendent. Um, it was just this amazing widespread movement. I think it lost that widespreadness sometime in the 70s, but historian Robert Self in his book about um, family values politics, he says that the hinge of history in of the late 20th century is, I, mean, I wrote it down, so I want to get his quote wrote. He says there was a moment when liberalism ceased to seem like a helping hand and started to seem um, like an invasive feeling. Let's see. Let me get this right. The moment when liberalism came to seem to many millions of ordinary Americans more like a moral threat than like an economic helping hand. This is the switch to family values rhetoric. And it's usually associated with um, Anita Bryant and her fight against uh, LGBTQ people in the 70s, or it's associated with Roe v. Wade and, and people feeling like these top-down liberals are imposing this immoral thing on them. Um, I think this textbook controversy actually shares a lot with Roe v. Wade, but it happened earlier. It seemed like a top-down liberal conspiracy to some people. And in the name of the freedom of some, they wanted to squelch the freedom of others. Um, they wanted to deny this textbook's um, some of them said, you know, the law says we have to use the textbook, but it doesn't say what we have to use it for. We could use it as a doorstop. They didn't really want students reading um, about African American history or immigrants, um, but they never, they never went away. You know, the John Birch Society, they actually still have a website. You can still look them up. They are still around, um, still fighting against collectivism. Um, but I think the fight against this was a rehearsal for what would become family values politics and what would become of an incredibly powerful politics that goes beyond the Birch Society. Um, these were people who thought they weren't partisan, like that letter I showed of, of I'm a Paul Revere and, and I'm sick of riots, but I'll go alert my neighbors to this. They thought they weren't partisan, but they were really concerned about, about the children and this family value stuff, which has really only grown since then. And now this year we have, well, last year the, um, the 1619 project came out from the New York Times. And this year, our um, former president tried to start the 1776 society in, con in contest with that. There's a controversy in Utah right now because one school is letting, letting parents sign their children out of the um, Black History Month activities. Um, it is still something that comes up of how we teach our past. Okay, we have a question here uh, from Irene Chin. Is the John Birch Society still active in Orange County or elsewhere in California or rest of USA? So it's like three questions in one. <laughs> it is. Um, it's less active in Orange County because Orange County has had, I mean, it's had demographic change and political change since the 60s, but it is still around. It's, um, and they're, at least their public footprint on the web is usually from places further inland, you know, like um, 29 Palms and areas like that. Um, I haven't studied John Birch Society today. That is a project for somebody else to do. Okay, I just want to remind everybody, if you have questions, please do uh, write them into the, into the uh, chat room. Um, 
Oh, I see. So Allison wants to know, was it a clearly organized push? The letters def definitely echoed each other's talking points, and some of which weren't even true talking points. Um, so there was some push and there was this um, film, which I found a copy of the film at UCLA, although in the UCLA archives, they don't actually have the wherewithal to watch a film. So I got to sort of shine a light through it and, and move it by manually to see this film. Fortunately, the film didn't seem to have narration, so I could manage to see it. Someone paid for that film. It's unclear who. It's not named. Um, somebody organized those meetings because the letters refer to these meetings. And many of the people wrote um, in the name of motherhood or grandmotherhood, which surprised me because um, what I knew from the other work on the new right was, was this thing of mothers, but it was a multi-generational thing of people concerned with kids' education. And so they didn't, they didn't want to leave full records. If it was John Birch Society, it actually, that fits with John Birch Society policies, but they did leave newsletters and so many of them, um, the scholars who study them say, oh, they were using this school thing to launch bigger political careers. But for so many of them, the bigger political career they wanted was to be on school board. They had a real sincere faith that school textbooks matter. And they really did care about how we teach history to our children. Uh, so let's see. Um, is, I love these questions. Um, is it typical how quickly the book was written? As someone who takes 10 years to write each of my books, I was shocked that this book got written in one summer. I mean, um, they, though, um, I did get to meet um, Coe's children, uh, John and Laurie's Coe, Coe um, they're still around. They have a great foundation. They use the profits from this textbook to make a foundation that, that helps give scholarships to students of color who want to study history. Um, they were also, uh, two of the authors of the textbook were presidents of the Organization of American Historians. These are, these are some pretty leading scholars. And what the Coe children said when I said, wow, they wrote it so quickly, but the Coe children said, they've been teaching the US history intro course for years. You know, they had all this in their notes. So they were just taking what they had been teaching in colleges and trying to translate it into an eighth grade level. The thing is that John Coe actually had been banned from teaching for a while in the 50s um, because he refused to sign the loyalty oath that all um, state professors are required to sign. Even now, when I came to Cal State Fullerton, I had to sign a loyalty oath, which surprised me. I don't know if you know that. All, all of your state professors sign a loyalty oath. When we go to HR for our new job and we get to pick what health plan we want and what dental plan we want, and then we have to sign a loyalty oath. John Coe, Coe refused. Um, he, and the thing is, the critics don't bring that up. This wasn't just late McCarthyism. This wasn't just knee jerk um, anti communism. This was a new kind of family values thing. Their talking points don't mention that Coe had been banned for teaching for two years. Although Coe always said, UCLA never made me give up my parking place. So they always wanted me to stay. Um, this was a different thing. And the people who fought it mostly were in places that were facing in real integration. Um, places like Downey, which is near to where African-American neighbors neighborhoods are, or Pasadena. Um, it was more of the inland Orange County, not the coastal Orange County. The, the most elite places didn't have as much resentment, but the places facing possible real integration really resented having an integrated textbook. It fascinates me how much they cared. Okay, um, so yes, let's see. I'm gotta catch up with all this. Um, hate groups in Orange County related to this textbook controversy. Um, you know, I don't know about hate groups today, but the people opposed to this textbook didn't think of themselves as hateful. They thought of themselves as very loyal and very patriotic, and they wanted to make sure that the next generation learned the same things they had learned. One of their critiques of this textbook is that they called it trivia. It has um, it has a poem about the boll weevil. Um, it has 
the poetry of Phyllis Wheatley, our first African-American poet during, during the Revolutionary War. It, to me, was surprising that this is what was eighth graders were exposed to, because this is stuff I learned about in grad school in the 90s. Um, these people in the 60s thought of it as trivia, even though really all kinds of different history can be trivia. To them, this seemed trivial because it wasn't the history they'd already learned. They, it wasn't so much that they were hateful, is that they were worried about change. And there was so much change going on in Orange County in the 60s. This is the stuff Lisa McGurr yeah, wrote about, right. too, of the, there is, you know, the towns are doubling in population every five or 10 years. The, the tract houses are growing up everywhere. People are moving from all over to come to Orange County. It's a disorienting time. And so a lot of people were reaching for what they saw as tradition. Um, although they were reaching for it in new ways. Um, Lisa McGurr, actually, after she wrote about the rise of the new right in Orange County, she ended up working at Harvard with Ernest May, one of the co-authors of this textbook. And uh, I talked to her about this and she told me that all the time, Ernest May would come up to her and say, so did you see anything about my textbook? Did you see anything about my book? And she had it. So she was so happy when I published about this because Ernest May just really wanted to hear that this was part of the rise of the new right. Lisa McGurr begins with um, the, her great book about Orange County. She begins with people going door to door to, um, to, do, uh, to recall a um, Joel Dvorman, who was on the school board in Anaheim and who was also a member of the ACLU, which they said made him a communist sympathizer. Uh, that recall election, she says, helped launch a lot of people's political careers. But then she moves very quickly from that school board stuff um, to national politics, but the school board stuff lingered. They had more recall elections in the Anaheim School Board. The statewide teachers association in the mid sixties advised all of its teachers to shun um, Anaheim and to not work in the entire Anaheim Unified School District, which was hiring a lot of people because so many people were moving here. So much was being built. So many kids were being born. The schools were a flashpoint um, in this time of great change. Let's see. Got another question here. Let's see. You said this textbook issue is associated with a debate regarding sex ed. Was it simply ha yeah. ah, because it was it challenged parents' norms of what was appropriate for school curriculum or something more? Both were accused of being a communist plot to ruin the morals of American youth. Um, so, so it was about morals and reaching the youth. Um, and Orange County in the 60s, uh, Natalia Petrozella has written about this. Um, some Orange County schools had a very progressive sex ed curriculum um, that, uh, that had been going on actually for years in the 60s before in 1967, there was all this uproar at the same time as there was an uproar over land of the free. Um, there was people ready to be motivated to show up at meetings and they were they showed up they booed they yelled there's uh, sometimes the police were involved taking people out of school board meetings this was um an incredible place where people found each other and found their own politics even though the school board in orange county at that time did not control either sex ed or the selection of eighth grade social studies textbooks um, but yes it does look like the same group and it does look like this related thing that both both seemed threatening at a time when there was generational change. Um, okay, so a, let's see. Got a um, question from Yvonne Wilson, which I don't know, might Yvonne, you might want to expand on this. Uh, are the issues slash history from Land of the Free now in the textbook? Oh, um, in textbooks. Ah, there we go. Okay. Yeah. The so, current are, ones. I mean, has that already been absorbed? Has that? You know, it were... hasn't, I don't think. Um, just judging from the students I get at Cal State Fullerton, they often have not imagined the perspective of workers. They often can't name many um, non-white Americans from the past. The When you look at the state standards, it um, the state standards list some very... Um, progressive things. Like it says, students should learn about Biddy Mason. Mm -hmm. I ask my students every year, anybody know Biddy Mason? Who is, um, you guys 
I'm sure this group probably knows she was she was a slave uh, brought from Utah to California when California was nominally a free state, and so she sued for her freedom. Um, and one, uh, she uh, she was a founder of the African American neighborhood in Los Angeles. She was also a midwife and a real estate investor. She's she's a pretty incredible person. Um, and there's really it's teaching about her is to me isn't controversial because she's so impressive and and because she used all the tools at her disposal to help move herself from from slavery to to founding the African American neighborhoods of LA. I have yet to meet many students who know of her. Um, the, or even Phyllis Wheatley, another, what I think of as an impressive story. It's appropriate that I'm telling you about this in February, that it's Black History Month, because I think the Black history that, that is in Land of the Free, <coughs> every chapter, um, you know, um, but it's there. That history still isn't known that well. And um, another thing, though, about if you take from the 1960s to the present, do textbooks address issues that took place from the 60s? Free speech, oh, yeah. civil rights, um, you know, other things that happened between 1960 and, and 2000? Yes. And I also think um, textbooks today often are going back to that kind of memorization. You know, it's there's the, the chapter questions, the quizzes, or there's a right and wrong answer. Where I think what's actually fun about history is the figuring out the stories, looking for the different perspectives, the open-endedness of this textbook, um, the fact that it did have a point of view which makes it incredibly readable. That has been lost, I think. I have yet to find a textbook that has as many interesting mm. assignments as this one has. All right. Uh, of course, yes, yeah, some of those subjects students don't know as they're coming into college, but I think you might also make an argument, an awful lot of people who are supposed to learn an awful lot of history don't know any of it. So true. sad, but true. Uh, <clears throat> if, it, if it wasn't, if they didn't learn it on uh, on cartoons, it might not exist to them. Um, yeah. Did you, uh, uh, John, uh, John Stoller writes, uh, did you find evidence of pro-Vietnam War attitudes influencing the, the attacks on, on this text? Was this fight just an extension of the anti-war slash pro-war debate? Yeah. yeah. Great question. Um, because the book was written in 65 before we had gotten really heavily involved in Vietnam. The book mentions mm -hmm. Vietnam, but but not much. Mm -hmm. I didn't notice much about Vietnam. Although, I mean, in the letters I showed you, there was that woman sick of picket riots. She said, I don't know quite what she means by picket riots. I think she might mean picket lines and protests in general. Um, it was a time when there were protests. But the people involved with this didn't see themselves as part of typical politics. They thought of history as outside of politics, as something more like a set of sacred texts. Um, it was a more almost religious thing for them. Uh, but I wasn't asking myself that question when I went through those letters. Um, it could be that there was definitely a lot of things and the Vietnam War politics were affecting the, um, the generational rift that some were feeling between older generations and younger generations and that they blamed this textbook for. But I mean, I don't think a textbook that got into the schools in 67 had anything to do with a protest from 65 at Berkeley, you know? Um, I just think there was this, these coincidences that were going on. I'm trying to get to all the rest of these questions because there's so all right. Many. Besides the cities in Southern California, were there other cities or counties in California that had the same sort of pushback against the book or outright banned it in their schools? Very few. There was a couple sort of, um, as I mentioned, like Yucca Valley, Inland Empire kind of places, but it was almost all centered around Los Angeles. The, the letters that defend the book and spoke up for it mostly were from the city of Los Angeles itself. The letters against it were from the wider suburbs, especially Orange County, but also um, Pasadena and uh, Thousand Oaks. And those were the places that had 
the least integration, but they felt threatened by integration, I think. Um, so Downey, Thousand Oaks, Pasadena, Downey, I made myself a map because I am a, an urban historian at heart. So I mapped where all these letters were from. It was very much Southern California suburban and then some of the further out suburbs. Um, there was every now and then there was like, you know, somebody in Big Bear, someone further afield, but not so many. Um, and I think that also connects to the fact that this protest went through uh, networks of people and communities of people who knew each other, maybe through John Birch meetings, maybe through their churches, maybe through their mothers and grandmothers group of whatever it was. Um, okay. Does it look like the same group of people also later opposed sex ed? Yes. Yeah. That was, they definitely, and especially in the Orange County School Board, where the Orange County School Board is, uh, doesn't have control over curriculum, or at least didn't in the 60s, they spent a lot of time debating both of these. Um, and they were raucous, loud meetings. Um, so yes, it was, it okay. was the same sort of thing. Yeah. Could you speak to the relationship between the Sunbelt migration, Goldwater, and the rise of libertarianism in Orange County? Boy, that's a whole meeting, I think. Uh, <laughs> These his, these histories seem to intersect with this text and other references you made tonight. Thanks. Yes. Um, I'm looking at my bookcase now to see if I have Darren Dochuk's book handy. Um, Darren Dochuk wrote a great book called From Bible Belt to Sun Belt, where he writes about how um, more than 11 million people left the South in the mid 20th century and mostly moved West. Um, Min and 11 million ended up in California, especially Southern California. Um, they didn't necessarily identify as conservatives where they came from, but when they got here, they often felt like the conservatives matched their traditionalism. Um, their, uh, often there was charismatic religion um, and some of it tied into libertarianism. And it absolutely tied into the protest over this textbook that those Southern sensibilities can still be Southern California. And they were seen by people on all sides of the political spectrum. African Americans in Los Angeles have long said, LA is Mississippi with palm trees. That LA has had some of the same kind of race relations and sensitivities that people recognize from Mississippi, from the bigger Bible Belt. Um, and I think too, these are people who felt a bit unmoored. I mean, who wouldn't when, when you've moved across the country and you've landed in these brand new suburbs um, and everything is changing. So for them trying to hold on to what they saw as traditional religion, but often was actually religion conveyed with the new technologies, you know, from radio to TV to podcasting now um, and holding on to traditional history, although doing it in in some new ways is part of what came to form their identity. Let's see other questions. Do, yeah, do you think this book would ever be used again in schools? Um, you know, I uh, I meant to tell you how the book is not perfect. It's it was written in the '60s, so it. I, let's see. I made a list of things wrong with it. There's not many, not many Latino stories, not many Asian American stories. African Americans disappear from 1877, the end of Reconstruction, until 1954, Brown v. Board. Um, apparently, African Americans did nothing for 70 years. Um, it's a it's description of Native Americans uses words like savage and uncivilized. Um, it's cringeworthy, really. Um, and uh, there is no women's history other than the fight for suffrage. We have changed our views of history in the years since 1965. What surprised me was how much of the history in this book is history I still teach. I still teach about Phyllis Wheatley. I still teach about Simon Rodia. Um, how much of it, it did have cultural history. It did have um, these open-ended questions. It did have an effort to be inclusive. So I don't think we should use it again, but I, I've got to say, I tell my students, you're, nobody's neutral. You don't have to pretend to be neutral. You, when you write an essay, it should have a thesis. And that, it, that means a point of view. You, you should have a point of view backed up by evidence and considering other points of view. 
You should be as fair and open-minded as you can be, but you get to have a point of view. That's what makes this stuff interesting. Um, and that I think we've lost from our textbooks. I think also we, um, College historians have been telling these multicultural histories really since the 60s. So the history that I teach, I think of as mainstream, hasn't reached the high schools or in this case, eighth graders. Um, that is, I think, the biggest tragedy that there is, there's a separation between university histories and K through 12 histories and, and general histories. All right. Uh, slightly off point, but how did you decide on researching and writing The Working Man's Reward? Oh, I was so, I, I'm, I love suburban history, which is also what led me to this, because it's a suburban story. The protesters were in the suburbs. Um, let's see, how did I start getting involved in suburban history? I think I got to grad school. I knew I wanted to go to grad school. And the first meeting we had of my incoming cohort, we were having a meal together and we went around the table and everybody said what they were interested in. And I didn't know I was supposed to be interested in a specific aspect of history. I felt like I, I decided I wanted to be a professor. I decided I wanted to come to grad school. I chose which grad school to come to. I decided what I wanted to study. It's American studies. Like those were a lot of decisions. I made them. I'm here now. I had no idea I was supposed to specialize. And we went around that table and the others Someone wanted to research um, hairstyles of the colonial era. And I, I was just, I was in awe of my fellow grad students and intimidated by them. And I was like, I don't want to research hairstyles of the colonial era. I mean, I'm interested in what you find out, but it's not my thing. It took me a while to figure out what my thing was. So after my first year of grad school, I went for a really long bike ride. For, I, I rode for a week. I went to grad school in New Haven, Connecticut. And I just rode north. And as I was riding, I was trying to figure out like all the stuff I'd learned, what I cared about, what I was gonna do. And I was riding through different cities. And when you ride on the East Coast, you're riding on the old post roads. You're riding, um, especially if you're, if you're riding a bike, you're riding the way people used to take horses. Um, and you can ride a bike about as far as people take, could take a horse in a day. And I was, try I was fascinated by how stuff was put together. I was fascinated by the spatiality of it. Um, I've always lived in suburbs and found them really intriguing. They get ignored in history often. People pay attention to the cities. People really are interested in the poorest people or the richest people. The middle class sometimes gets lost among academic historians. And I just felt like there's important history here. So the Working Man's Reward came out of looking at um, ads from earliest suburbs. And ever since then, suburban history is the thing I do. And I do it in different ways. My new book is A People's Guide to Orange County. It's about the diverse histories that have happened here. Um, and, uh, but that's that interest in, in space and in the middle class, that's a history I've had since my first year of grad school. That was a long answer, but I feel like you guys are an attentive audience. Well, we all find our niche in time. The, the areas that, you know, we're, we're, we're digging through the records or we're reading old newspapers or we're interviewing people and suddenly something comes up and you just catch your breath and say, oh, my gosh, I got to do something with that. There's the things you want to know more about, you know? Yes. That woman who wanted to research hairstyles of the colonial era, she's now a union organizer in Detroit. You know, <laughs> <her>. <laughs> but she's got awesome hair, so you know, it's all good. Okay, actually she recently had cancer, so her hair is gone, oh. um, but she has great fashion taste. Um, <laughs> she's, um, those, those people who intimidated me who seemed like they knew exactly what they were gonna do, turns out they didn't. Um, so I guess that's another lesson for those of you who find yourself the way I did in the beginning of grad school at Yale, feeling, feeling lost. Um, for me, researching suburbs and trying to understand home ownership um, in, the, in my first book and the diversity of, of, uh, of Orange County in my second book, that's, uh, that's what I end up being fascinated with. And let's see, Trying to get to these other things. Yeah, the book was the book was designed for eighth grade. How did history books for other grade levels compare? Great question. And you know what? I haven't fully answered it. 
there is no place where you can find just the list of textbooks used at different times. You can find the current textbooks. Um, and I know how many high schools must have storage closets with the old textbooks, but I actually couldn't find what were the other textbooks um, because it wasn't um, a heavy in the Los Angeles Times, so then I didn't have a name I could trace and I didn't I didn't have those clues I could pull. I did toy with the idea of just interviewing older history teachers who must know this stuff. It's actually not saved anywhere. And the educational historians, um, they're not the most careful group. The educational historians who write about Land of the Free, they say John Hope Franklin wrote it. And he was one of the authors, but he wasn't the lead author. Um, they say it was it was about African American history. And it includes African Americans, but not as much. They had really dug into the archives and the educational history has just kept on actually repeating the same slightly wrong points about it. The, the same as the um, conservatives who attacked it. So I didn't end up following through. Um, I had kids and got distracted with other things. Someone else should find out what have been the different textbooks. Um, I do know that after 1971, there was a choice of textbooks and, and they were never controversial. Um, that's as much as I can tell you. Let's see, People's Guide publication date. I can say it's, um, it's supposed to come out next fall from the University of California Press, although we're, we're still doing copy editing now. So it, it, it'll be out next fall or winter. Um, it's, uh, it doesn't always fit with other histories of Orange County. So I think it'll, um, I think it'll cause a lot of discussions. I'm, I'm looking forward to it. Um, and where can you buy my book? Um, Working Man's Reward is, you can buy it anywhere books are sold. It came from Oxford University Press and People's Guide to Orange County will be University of California Press. So wherever books are sold. Oh my goodness. And here's John and Kathy Didion wrote me a private message. Can I t share this with everybody? Sure. They wrote, they were in eighth grade in 1967 to 68, and this was their history textbook, which is, it's amazing to hear that because most people don't remember their eighth grade history textbook. Um, I don't remember mine. I remember my teachers. I remember things we did in class, but not the textbook. Um, so I am so curious. John and Kathy Didion, do you want to tell the rest of us about what you remember? Well, it's just John. Kathy is... Okay. Uh a couple of years younger, so she would probably not appreciate me lumping her into the- uh, <laughs> Sorry, I didn't mean to put the, you together. I'm just- That, really that cohort, you. but uh, I, you know, I remember it for a couple of reasons. Uh, one was my mom was a school employee. She was a classified employee in the school districts. Uh, I was in the Anaheim Union High School District. Uh, and I remember the controversy more than anything because it was the time of the sex ed challenge and the, you know, the school board was recalled and the superintendent was fired and there was all this going on. And so the, you know, the teachers were quite upset that you know, they, they were feeling that they were attacked um, for, you know, a variety of reasons. Um, but uh, I think the one thing I remember about the, I, I remember certainly the controversy but the one thing I remember about the book, I think it had an illustration in it of the Biddle Passage. And that was quite shocking to my sensibilities. And then when you put it in the context of what happened in 1968 and the civil rights movement and the assassination of Martin Luther King, and it was a very interesting time to be, uh, you know, there was so much history happening all around us. Uh, the book was sort of, almost secondary. You know, um, with John Coey, uh, one of the critics actually earlier before this book called up UCLA, the history department to complain that John Coey was going to protests. And the secretary who answered the phone said, well, you know, our historians don't just write about history, they do history. Um, so there was this feeling that this was history. That's such an amazing story that you remember this. Um, and yeah, I think uh, it was 
it, one of the critiques that some of the letter writers wrote about was they felt that reminding African American students of their menial past would would leave African American students feeling badly about themselves. So those uh, those the description of the, that you remember about the Middle Passage or about the horrors of slavery, they were sort of twisting that same argument that had come up in Brown versus Board of Education about about self esteem in African Americans, and it's this very fascinating idea that that telling an honest history could hurt somebody's self esteem. Uh, but that wasn't the book's point at all. The book's point was of the fight towards freedom that had been a long and ongoing fight, not just happening in the U.S. War for Independence. Um, so thank you so much for sharing that. That's so fascinating. Yeah, well, one more question here. Uh, Tracy Falk asks, where did they attend school? I think that's a question for John Didion. Oh, he said Anaheim. Oh, yeah. Anaheim. Okay. Yeah. I wasn't quite Crescent, sure where you were headed, but I figured you'd clarify. <laughs> yeah, Crescent Junior High School, which is no longer there, but Anaheim, California. Um, and, uh, but that was uh, the Anaheim Union High School District was a very large district at the time and was considered uh, very progressive uh, for the, its, you know, sex education and other things. And, uh, then that came to a screeching halt. Yeah, and it's interesting that your your teachers resented this book because I think this, those kind of open-ended questions are actually very hard to assign and grade. It was expecting a lot of teachers. Oh, no, I, I didn't mean they resented the book. They resented uh, all of the attacks on, oh, okay. on the district and on public education. And I think they, uh, they took you know, exception to being uh, challenged like that. Uh, I, I, I don't, I didn't feel like, I, I had a great history teacher. I didn't feel like he was uh, struggling with the book at all. And he was a very engaged historian. And, uh, and so, uh, you know, it was, it was a lively class, but I think we honestly spent a lot more time talking about what was happening in the daily newspaper because it was just, a mm -hmm. constant onslaught in 1967-68. That is amazing. That's great that you have so much vivid memories of eighth grade. Wow. Well, um, and we have, let's see, one more. Are you open to us reaching out if we're working on some related projects? Absolutely. I'm a professor at Fullerton, so so we are public employees, We and we are here. My email is my first initial and my last name at fullerton.edu. The only challenge is you have to spell my last name, which is not easy. And yeah, we'll put that, we'll post that. We'll put that, uh, we'll put that on our uh, social media or our Facebook page. Yeah. Um, and we, you know, we all, all of us who work in history need to, you know, work with each other. You know, it's the, uh, it's, it's an additive process. So <laughs> absolutely. That's great. Great. Okay. Uh, there it is. All right. Well, thank you so much uh, for this great evening and uh, and um, for for uh, coming and speaking tonight, Elaine. And and thank you to everyone who attended this evening. Um, and uh, hope to see you all back here next month. Um, and um, I'm uh, I'll just kind of say in passing. Uh, I'm also uh, working on. <laughs> Back on the back on the horse, working on getting a journal together. So um, if anybody has articles and they want to talk to me about it, uh, um, uh, or ideas for things you uh, want to write about, uh, do shoot me an email. And we'll go from there. But thank you all. Uh, good to see everyone, and um, look forward to seeing you next month. Yes, thank you. You guys are an amazing audience. Thank you so much. You're a great speaker. Thank you. <laughs>